here and welcome you to the uh, campfire chat. I always find it more easier to uh, set up the way we would set up at home when we're visiting with our elders and knowledge keepers. It's easier to uh, be able to speak from that perspective. And I hope you're having a happy indigenous day today. All week, I know Calgary will be busy, and other cities will be busy celebrating Indigenous Week. I just want to welcome you to the campfire chat. I want to thank you for uh, coming to our camp, but also virtually, we're on virtual. Uh, and I, I welcome all the ones that are on the virtual screens. Um, I just want to maybe pass it over to my partner, Alicia. Sure. So Campfire Chats is an annual event presented by the University of Calgary. Campfire Chats was initiated and launched during the U Calgary's 50th year anniversary in 2016. The program focuses on Indigenous storytelling around past, present, and future challenges of our city to ignite passionate curiosity in the citizens of Calgary towards building our innovative and dynamic city around an informal campfire setting. So as Reg said, today is June 21st, National Indigenous Peoples Day, and we're proud to present this event on this day. National Indigenous Peoples Day, June 21st, is an official day of celebration to recognize and honor the achievements, history, and rich cultures of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in Canada. Back to you, Keko. Hey. I just wanna uh, introduce myself. My name is Reg Crowshu. I'm from the Pikani First Nation in Southern Alberta. I speak uh, Blackfoot. Um, I work with the University of Calgary with Michael Hart in the uh, Indigenous uh, Strategy for the past five years that we've been working on it. And I'm all happy for the strategy and working with elders doing uh, building framework in the right way to look at how we might address the strategies that we follow today. Zina. And I'm Alisa Tiemann, and I'm from the Stony Nakota Wesley First Nation. Um, and I um, work as a cultural education and protocol specialist with the um, with UCalgary Indigenous Strategy. And I'm proud to be here and I welcome you all. Thank you. Kako. I just want to introduce uh, some of our panelists. I, in our uh, when we have our when we at home at our camps, usually the men sit on one side and the women on that side. In our way, what I've heard from the old people was the sun. We follow natural law, and the sun on this side during the day, the men seem to do all the uh, singing and ceremonies and doing the work and on this side was uh represents the the old lady we call her the moon Kukumikiso. and she in those the stories from from the old lady is the stories about honor respect and trust those principles so that's why we sit in uh uh with the men's side on this side and women on that side. And when we have visitors, my dad used to say, well, the old lady will measure. And I, I don't call you an old lady, but <laughs> <laughs> on the female side, we'll, we'll measure the honor and respect. And the man will respect uh, or will look at uh, if this guy works and you know, doesn't sleep till noontime and break the natural law of the sun and so on. So that's why we're, I'm glad we're able to come together in, 
in this kind of a, a setting. So I'll, I'll introduce the men's side and Elisha uh, uh, can uh, introduce the women's side. I, first of all, I just want to mention Michael Hart, uh, Dr. Michael Hart. Uh, he's our leader with the Indian indigenous strategy at the University of Calgary. Um, and the other one I want to introduce is uh, um, Uh, you're uh, 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 Le Dr. Leroy Little Bear uh, from the University of Lethbridge. Mm -hmm. I want to welcome him today also. Also, we call him many names. One of them is Istoye, uh, which means cold weather uh, in Blackfoot. And then I want to introduce Rod Hunter as one of our singers. And Gina. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Elder Doreen Burgum, who uh, will be starting us off in a good way with an opening prayer and a smudge uh, soon. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Tasha Hubbard um, and Maria Marchand. Thank you. Um, I just, oh, I think one of the things that I always think about um, the concept of land acknowledgement. I know with indigenous thought and perspective, land acknowledgement is so important. But today, many, many indigenous strategies start with the land acknowledgement. So Maybe I want to mention uh, the land acknowledgement, and, and uh, I want to mention it from our, our thought of how we might connect to the land. But in indigenous thought, the land represents uh, um, our governance. Uh, we are a part of the land, the environment, uh, the ecosystem along with all the other animals and other humans. So I want to acknowledge uh, uh, today, we're in Mohkins, uh, which uh, is a place that we always come together. Uh, and uh, uh, when the settlers came, they called it Calgary. But it's, uh, uh, today is the home of the Treaty 7 uh, people, the uh, uh, Stony, Nakoda, um, Bears Paw, and Wesley Band. Uh, Ganao is also represented here. Pikani, Sikrika, um, also uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Region Three Métis are also in the area today. So. I just want to acknowledge those lands today and our connection to those lands. Anya, yeah, I just want to also introduce Rod Hunter. Rod uh, um, gifted the university uh, with a, a song. So uh, we use the song to acknowledge our gatherings, but I also acknowledge our uh, graduates at convocation, anytime we need an honor song, the honor song was given to the strategy and uh, indigenous strategy. And uh, I wanna ask Rod to give us the song today, so. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Reg, for calling me by my taxation name, Rod Hunter. Thanks to Gerald. Yeah, oh, hey, 
at my paper here. <laughs> hey, thank you, Rod. Uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge Rod for, I think sometimes <laughs> when we're at uh, the week of graduation at the uh, convocation at the university, he was there every day about three or four times a day singing this song. So. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge Rod and his uh, song today. The uh, uh, importance of the uh, Itota Bitab strategy, which guides the University of Calgary. I, I started about 2017. Uh, I know uh, um, at that time, they were looking at putting together an indigenous strategy. So one of the things they were looking at, if they followed Western uh, ways of doing, written default ways of doing strategy, all they would do is go back to their written uh, uh, policies, build a framework, and then introduce it so that everybody conforms to this uh, framework. But uh, that was something that indigenous people uh, went through all their lives and imposing of a, 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 a written system. So I'm glad the University of Calgary at that time brought in all the elders from the uh, surrounding communities. And uh, the leader at that time for that group was the, was, uh, the late uh, Andy Blackwater. Uh, that gave us the name of Itota Pitabati uh, for the strategy. But since then, we've worked with the group of elders uh, looking at direction, how to interpret certain things, how to be uh, culturally interpret and culturally translate, uh, building a framework so that we can uh, uh, do the right thing on uh, indigenous strategy and I'm glad Michael has been leading us. He also has uh, his uh, um, worldviews and his uh, indigenous ways and and uh, I find uh, Michael very understanding in working with the strategy. Anya. Uh, mentions. Uh, so it was launched in the fall of 2017. Um, and our Indigenous strategy um, guides the university's future decisions and actions with respect to indigenizing our campus um, through the overarching themes uh, that shape the recommendations within that document. Um, the guiding principle of the strategy is in a good way. 
Um, and in a good way is an Indigenous concept that demonstrates uh, working with clear purpose, um, integrity, uh, moral strength, and uh, communal spirit. Um, and New Calgary is moving towards uh, genuine reconciliation um, following a commitment to deep evolutionary transformation. Thank you. I think at this time, my, uh, Michael joining us via uh, uh, Zoom or sad, satellite. So I'll turn it over to Michael Hart. Ebuistich, Denistafta, Danse, Danse. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Campfire Chats. Whether you're joining us in person or virtually, thank you. We are so happy to have you here. June is Indigenous History Month, marking a time to reflect on a diverse history that Indigenous peoples have had on this land for millennia, and acknowledging the history created as a result of colonialism. This month also marks the one year anniversary of confirming the findings of 215 children that were buried in a mass grave at the former residential school in Kamloops, BC. It's important to take a moment to reflect upon all the recent discoveries of Indigenous children buried in unmarked graves on or adjacent to residential schools across the country. Today on National Indigenous Peoples Day, we remember them. We remember their families and their communities who have suffered from this loss. Today at Campfire Chats, our esteemed panel is here to discuss the Buffalo Treaty and in following the cultural protocols, we would like to gift all our speakers on stage today with items in recognition of your guidance and wisdom being shared, including broadcloth and tobacco. Buffalo hold much significance and the Buffalo Treaty signed on September 24th, 2014, recognizes, honors, and revitalizes the relationship we have with them. We must remember that Buffalo were a cornerstone to traditional ways of life, socially, spiritually, and in many other ways. Signatories of the Buffalo Treaty and other supporters are working to restore the Buffalo. I'm proud to work from an institution like the University of Calgary that supports events such as this, that help recognize the importance of this work. Campfire Chats is brought to you by the joint efforts of the Office of Advancement and the Office of Indigenous Engagement and ITAPITO, which guides the University of Calgary on its path of transformation and communicates its commitment and responsibility for truth and reconciliation. Campfire Chats aligns with the Indigenous strategy through ways of being and ways of connecting, through community engagement and relationships, and the inclusivity of Indigenous people's knowledge. Throughout the year, the Indigenous strategy supports many events, and Campfire Chats is just one of many that are presented to unpack the complexities of colonialism and to spotlight Indigenous thinkers and leaders. As we grow, as we continue to grow as an institution, it's imperative we maintain platforms for Indigenous and allied voices to be heard to make space for Indigenous ways of knowing, doing, connecting and being across our campus and beyond. I recognize that the journey towards transformation is going to take time, requiring good hearts in the hands of many. We would not be able to do that without the support and guidance and participation from diverse communities we serve. I would like to extend my thanks to the incredible guests we have with us today. Dr. Reg Kroshu, Elder Doreen Virgin, Elder Rod Hunter, Elder and Scholar Leroy Littlebear, Tasha Hubert, and Marie E. Marchand. I would also like to thank TD Insurance for their sponsorship, Telesparks, for hosting this event the University of Calgary Alumni Association for their partnership, and everyone at the University of Calgary who has had a hand in planning this event. A large part of the continued success of this event, this annual event, is the participation, participation rather, and engagement from our audience. Thank you once again to everyone who is with us watching the event, both in person and virtually. I encourage you to engage in, a, in, in the journey of reconciliation reconciliation beyond this event by sharing your learning through the meaningful conversations with friends, 
families and colleagues. I encourage you to go beyond discussion, to participate in other events, to even initiate your own events, to bring us together on this parallel journey between Indigenous peoples and all other Canadians. I thank you for joining us. I just, I wonder if they could put up the, the TP uh, uh, design that we had on the background. There we go. Uh, I'm tired of using paper. I'm going to put it down. <laughs> I just want to uh, uh, talk a bit about uh, a little bit of background. Uh, Leroy and I were talking about uh, some of the history, the stories. We look at stories as um, our uh, indigenous knowledge. And I hate to call them stories because what they are is our uh, narratives of experiences, research, uh, uh, communication that uh, happened with our uh, uh, people uh, before any writing ever came along. But it's one of those narratives we were talking about with regards to Buffalo, and we're going to be talking about the Buffalo Treaty today. But one of the narratives I was uh, uh, telling Leroy, I heard from my father and my grandmother, was uh, a time in the beginning of, uh, uh, of our people. And at that time, the uh, uh, Buffalo used to live in the water. So yes, stomach. And as they lived in the water, they would uh, um, set traps for humans because they used to eat humans and the traps were set on the water. So if you look at the design, the buffalo here had the buffalo head, but the body that lived in the water, that's how we, the stories came with the buffalo, uh, first buffalo that were in the water. And the circles, like the rainbow circles that's around them, those are the, the, their traps. They call them their traps that are in the water, the whirlpools. If you swim into one of them or walk through one of them, you go down. And that's how, uh, uh, that was part of the story of how the buffalo took humans and ate them. Anyway, in this story, the, the uh, chief of the buffaloes in the water came out on the land and turned himself into a human being. And he met a, 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 a woman. He kept he seeing this woman going for wood, but he went to meet her. And uh, um, he uh, uh, want, asked her to marry her. And that was a, it's a long story. I'm just going really fast. And uh, she, she said, I'm going to take you home to my father. And I'll ask him. So he invited him home. And the man asked him, uh, uh, told him, we're going to share a meal. So he cooked uh, his meal. And it was some uh, deer meat that he had cooked it. And as they were eating, the man noticed the, the, the one that wanted to marry his daughter wasn't eating the meat. He was eating more of the greens, the roots and the, and the green stuff that, uh, that we had with our meal. So then, then he left. <clears throat> And when he left, he went back to his camp and he told, he went into the water and he told the, the leader, his father, that he wanted to marry this woman. And the father, the Soyistami, the chief of the buffaloes in the water, said, do you know we eat humans? Why do you want to marry this woman? And he said, you know, that he really wanted to, he met her and he turned into a woman and he, they had their discussion. He said, you know, it's against our ways and you've, you've broken our ways. But as a father to his son, yeah, okay, uh, well, well we, we can bring her 
home. So he brought her into the water to live with, with him. And then uh, uh, the father invited them again to eat. But this time he told him, you bring the meat that you eat. So when they brought the meat, they ate and they cooked it. And when the man tasted it, he noticed that it, 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 he couldn't eat it. And then he realized, he put two and two together, and he realized that was human meat. And then he knew that was uh, the buffalo from the water that was after his daughter. Um, so he went back, he ran back into the water with his wife, his new wife. And the chief at that time of the buffalo in the water said, okay, We'll make an agreement. We'll make an agreement that we'll give half of our buffalo to the people and they can give us half of their people so that we can exist at all times and we'll take only what we need. Um, so that agreement was made. But the buffaloes that were chased out, they were in the water looking like this. But then when they came out, they uh, uh, they had four legs like uh, like we see buffalo today. And anyway, um, but the humans didn't send half of their people. So uh, uh, all that that fall, that winter, the water was frozen, and they crossed the the, the lake. And as they were crossing, half of them crossed first, the second half crossed. And, uh, and the young boy seen a horn coming out of the water. And he cried for it. It was a baby crying for that horn. So his mother pitied him and started breaking the ice around this horn. And he happened to hit the horn. And that must have been the nerve to the to the water, the buffalo in the water, and he shook his head. When he shook his head, all the people went in, the half of the people. He needs you. So, he need is what we call uh, the people or the buffalo, because they, they, those people were taken at that time. Inichi or ini. Inichi means drowning and ini means, you know, the end of them taking the people. So that's what we call the buffalo ini today. So there's many different versions of the story, but that was the story I heard from the old lady. Uh, so that was how the, that first treaty agreement was made in this cheese. And uh, with, the, with the story, the old lady or the old man sang the song. The song from the buffalo saying that humans are my children because that's the ones they took that went into the water and that was the agreement and part of that agreement was you take what you need you don't over be overkill because we need the buffalo for the ecosystem for all of us to survive till forever so those that would be some of the background we were talking about to that agreement that happened well, that we might say the beginning of time, uh, beginning of our ways, our, our life ways. So that with that story, I just want to welcome Leroy Ikashkini today uh, to get to talk about the Buffalo Treaty that uh, he's been working on and involved with. So I'll turn it over to you, Anya. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> uh. Uh. 
I was just talking to you in Mongolian. No, I'm just talking, I'm just joking. I was just introducing myself in uh, Blackfoot. My Blackfoot name is uh, Reggie said, it's Ika skinny. It translates as low horn. And I belong to the small robes clan of the Gano or blood tribe. And we're of the Blackfoot Confederacy. I was uh, <clears throat> teasing Rod and I was telling him about my late friend, Sykes Powder Face. You know that the Stonies are famous for putting on rock festivals. And, you know, and it, uh, I was telling another audience about, about this Nakoda and a Cree guy were taken around their Blackfoot friend, showing them around this territory. And then the Dakota and the Cree guy, they were uh, arguing which about their language, about which language was more sacred and so on. But as they were driving around, they got into a fatal car accident and they all got killed. And when they appeared at the uh, creator's TP, they were all outside and the creator heard somebody outside of the TP. So he got up, the creator got up and opened the uh, TP flap. And his first, his first thing, he noticed these three guys there. And his first word was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about about treaty and then I'll come to the uh, Buffalo Treaty as Reggie has given you a little bit of the background I want to give you a little bit about contemporary uh, legal aspect about treaties. Most people, when we talk about treaties, the first thing that comes up in their minds is Treaty 7, Treaty 6, and those type of treaties. Well, Reggie just told us about a treaty that's been made, you know, since the beginning of time. So treaties are really not new to 
to our people. We've, we've had treaties even with the animal and environmental world that we've been in since the beginning of time. But in the contemporary world, treaties really are acts of sovereigns, you know, sovereign entities, nations, and so on. Nations enter into agreements. And Treaty 6, Treaty 7, Treaty 8, here in Alberta, let's say, are, are of the same status as you would see, for instance, agreements similar to the free trade agreements that Canada, Mexico, and the United States have entered into. They're at the same level. You know, those treaties, you know, that we've had with the Crown and with the United States and so on, they're of that same level, so on. And in fact, the uh, Blackfoot Confederacy, for instance, in fact, has entered into a treaty with both the United States and the British Crown. We have a we have an 1855 treaty with the United States, and in fact, we're we've been included in more than one American treaty. You know, Treaty of Fort Laramie, for instance, in 18, 1852, you know, the Blackfoot were included in that treaty too. So treaties really are, you know, agreements between sovereigns. And our, our First Nations have had many, on many occasions, have entered into treaties between themselves, between themselves. So that, for instance, if you go over to the uh, Southwest Saskatchewan in the Cypress Hills area and so on, you've heard a uh, sitting bull, for instance, coming across into, into Blackfoot territory, for instance, and the, in what is now the Grasslands National Park. There's, you know, where he camped and so on. He entered into treaties with our First Nations on this side of the border. And in fact, some of the trade-offs culturally were that the we refer to the Sioux, some of the Sioux people that are now on the other side of the, on the south side of the international boundary as the parted hairs, you know, uh, guy specs, you know, the parted hairs. And one of them was that you see the big drums now that are all over in powwow country. Those were one of the trade-offs, you know. We've always had the small drums and so on. And in fact, we even traded the songs. Guy Spanish exists. We traded the songs and so on with them. And they gave us the uh, long, you know, the uh, headdresses and so forth. Our traditional headdresses or the straight up headdresses and so on, traded those kind of trade-offs and so on. And so those were examples of, and you know, 
We've had treaties with the Cree, for instance, between the Blackfoot and so on. And those treaties are still living treaties and so on. They're still being recognized. So, and, you know, so treaties are not new to us. They didn't just begin, you know, for instance, in 1877 with Treaty 7. We've had treaties since the beginning of time, as Reggie pointed out, even with the animal world and so on. And they're still in existence. And in British Columbia, for instance, today, treaties are still being made still being entered into, you know? And the point to be made is that these treaties are people as sovereign people still have the ability and full capability as sovereign nations to enter into these treaties. And so back in the early 2000s, one of, our, one of our grad students entering into environmental science, working with some of our elders at, at the University of Lethbridge, invited, invited us to go out to one of the gatherings out at standoff. And the notion about the buffalo came up at one of in the, in the discussion. And the elders there at that discussion started to express the idea that our youth here the stories, the songs, and the ceremonies that are related to the buffalo, because the buffalo is so important to our culture and so on. But when you look out there on the plains, there's no buffalo to be seen, you know? And the example I give to non-Indians, non-Indigenous people is you can have all your Christian beliefs and so on, etc. But if you don't see that little corner church, you know, if you don't see little crosses all over, you know, well, you're just a little bit less Christian, you know, thing. And well, that's what happened to our people. We still have all the songs. We still have all the ceremonies. We still have all the stories, so on, but no buffalo to be seen, see. And so that was the concern our elders had. And they always said, we'd like to see those buffalo come back. And as a result of that, we started to have what we called buffalo dialogues all over. We just invited people to come and tell buffalo, buffalo stories and so on, all over, all over southern Alberta, you know, and across the border uh, into Black, to the Blackfeet Reservation and so on. We had so many of these, these dialogues, we lost count. And, you know, one of the, one of uh, Amethyst's uh, favorite stories was one of our people was they were making what we call the 
bingo road on the blood reserve from standoff to Lethbridge. You know, everybody drives from standoff over from the res over to Lethbridge to play bingo. And, but they were going to pave the road and they, uh, these surveyors, non-indigenous, you know, non-indigenous surveyors, they were surveying the road and the surveyor, one of the surveyors was looking through his scope and he was looking through the scope and then he'd stand aside and look, look through the scope again. Finally, he told his, his, one of his assistants, come over here, look through that scope and tell me what you see. And so the guy was looking through the scope too, and he did the same thing. Look through the scope, stand aside, look all over the place, look through the scope, and finally, the, the boss says, what do you see? He says, well, when I look through the scope, I see thousands of buffalo out there, so on. And there was, a, he says, I see a camp out there too, teepees and so on. And the road was going to go right through that camp. And so they purposely decided to go around the camp. And so the elder said, well, you can tell that the spirit of the buffalo is still with us. You know, the spirit of the buffalo is still with us. And it was in the fall of, and summer of, and fall of 2013, that the, the elder said, okay, I think we're all of one mind. We would like to get and bring the buffalo back. But we can't do it by ourselves. We've got ranchers and farmers and the government, national parks and so on. We need help. We better go and visit our neighbors on both sides of the border. And because we know the situation is the same with their tribe, their youth, and so on. Let's go and ask them to, to see if we can all get together. In the old days, we used to sign treaties amongst ourselves. Let's see if we can interest them in signing a treaty on bringing the buffalo back. So during the fall of 2013 into early 2014, we worked on, invited them, and we worked on the Buffalo Treaty, drafted the Buffalo Treaty. And it was in September of 2014 that the Buffalo Treaty was signed on the Blackfeet Reservation on the American side. Four tribes from the American side, Fort Peck Reservation, Fort Belknap, the Blackfeet, and the Salish and Kudni on the American side. On this side, uh, Siksika, Kena, Bikani, and uh, Tsutsina signed the Buffalo Treaty. Shortly after that, you know, our Nakoda people along with, along with Samson signed the treaty. And 
ever since then, we've had over 30 other First Nations have signed on to the Buffalo Treaty. Less than a month ago, about three weeks ago now, two more, two more First Nations, one, one the Lippin Band in Texas and the uh, Northern Arapaho on the Wind River, Wind River Reservation have signed on. And in about another month's time, we're expecting 10 to 12 more First Nations from Saskatchewan to be signing on to the Buffalo Treaty in, uh, at, not, at Wanaskewin near Saskatoon. Now, <clears throat> the Buffalo Treaty itself speaks to conservation, conservation, you know, restoration, and so on of Buffalo. It speaks to culture, bringing back that relationship and so on with, with Buffalo. It speaks to education. It speaks to health. So much healthier eating bison, bison burgers. It speaks to health and as we said, it speaks to economics and it speaks to research, so on. Those are all areas that the Buffalo Treaty speaks to. And the signatories can work together or they can work individually on any aspect of the treaty itself. The, the signatories have also opened the door to allow NGOs, in other words, organizations and individuals to also sign the treaty, not as, not as sovereigns, because only sovereigns can sign treaties, but as supporters to the whole idea about what that Buffalo Treaty is all about. And so we have hundreds of individuals that have signed the treaty and hundreds of NGOs have also signed on to the treaty. And the treaty itself has opened the door, has had quite an impact in a number of developments that have taken place. One of the examples is the uh, National Bison Range in Flathead Country, in fact, on the Salish Kudney Flathead Reservation in Montana. And the brief history behind that is about a hundred years ago, with good intention to save the buffalo, the president decided to restore the buffalo and protect whatever few buffalo there was. But without consultation with the, with the Indians, opened up the National Bison Range on the Flathead Reservation and called it the National Bison Range. And it's been there ever since. So it's been there for 
over a hundred years now. Well, about a month ago, let me back up. One of the first things that the signatories to the to the national, I mean to the Buffalo Treaty, at one of their first meetings, they signed the resolution to have the National Bison Range returned to the uh, Flathead Reservation to the tribe. Well, about a month ago, the uh, Salish and Kudni had a big celebration. The National Bison Range has been returned. You know? Well, that's one of the things that has had that impact. And it has had an impact across the country and so on. We've had people from British Columbia now that want to use the Buffalo Treaty as a template for a salmon treaty. In Manitoba, they want to have a water treaty based on and similar to the Buffalo Treaty. So, but I could tell you many more stories, but due to our time, time limits, I'll, I'll save those for another time. But that's a brief background about the Buffalo Treaty. And so, if you want more information, I'll let my fellow panelists speak to that. Thank you. Yeah. No. I would like to formally introduce our two panelists here to my right. Um, so we have Dr. Tasha Hubbard, uh, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Native Studies, uh, Department of English at the University of Alberta. She's also from the Papikasis yeah, First okay. Nation. And she's also the founding member of the International Buffalo Relations Institute. Um, and then we also have Marie-Yves Marchand, Marie-Yves Marie Marchand, uh, who coordinated the Bison, sorry, the, the Bison Belong Initiative and actively supports uh, the Buffalo a Treaty of Cooperation, Renewal and Restoration as uh, the director of the International uh, Buffalo Relations Institute. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be here. I did my PhD here at the University of Calgary. Um, so it's nice to be back. Feels like a little bit like coming home. Um, I uh, started supporting the Buffalo Treaty in 2015. Uh, but prior to that, I, I did my master's and, and graduate work on uh, stories of the Buffalo and creative expression by indigenous people that shows the way that we are connected to the Buffalo uh, I started doing this work because some elders took me to visit a buffalo stone um, in southern Saskatchewan. And uh, we sang to the song, um, or we sang to the stone. And I just started after that point in time, uh, my, I just, that's all I was thinking about was, was the buffalo. And thinking about the impact it had on us as Indigenous people, uh, when their numbers uh, were destroyed. And I realized that in, you know, learning about the buffalo in school and things like that, that it was always focused on food. And absolutely, no buffalo, that, that was part of, part of the agreement <laughs> was, was that. But also realizing that it went much more deep than that. And so that's what sort of set me on a path of, of, of learning and asking questions and, and thinking about that. And so in the process of that work, uh, I was introduced to uh, the late Narcissus Blood in 2009. And we started visiting. And um, you know, Maria Campbell, who's been an elder of mine for years, talks to a group of us about 
the necessity of visiting as a, as a way of learning. And so Narcissus and I would make the trip. Sometimes I'd go to Fort McLeod, sometimes he'd come to Calgary and we would talk about Buffalo and he, we would talk about that impact that it had on us and as trauma, as a wave of trauma. We talk about the epidemics and we talk about you know, residential schools and absolutely, but the loss of the Buffalo affected us on, 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 a, on a very deep level. And as a result, they miss us and we miss them. And so that's how I've been looking at my work is, and in the work of supporting Leroy and Amethyst and others with the Buffalo Treaty, is if we understand that, that at our core and at their core, we miss each other. Um, and what does that mean to come back to each other? And it's what I really loved about working with the treaty is that it's also an acknowledgement that, you know, when we're bringing the buffalo back, when we're, when we're doing that work to physically have them come back, just as though it, it's beyond the physical of we eat them, it's on a, a lot of different levels. It's on, an, it's on an emotional level. It's on a spiritual level. Um, and so the work I do, I, I think about, um, and the work we do with the treaty, a lot of it is around what Leroy calls buffalo consciousness. And in that, it's, it's, it's being able to put the buffalo in our minds on a regular basis, on a daily basis, uh, just as, as we would have, you know, when, when we were walking on this land and we were walking with them. Um, and so we do that through a variety of, of, of things. I am a filmmaker by practice. So I've made digital stories on the buffalo. Uh, for Leroy and Amethyst and the Buffalo Treaty, and now we're working on a feature documentary um, that tells the story of different nations that some of whom are signatories, some of whom we hope are going to be signatories, uh, but ultimately it's, it's all people who, who feel that connection, who feel that passion, who have, for whatever reason, and they all have stories similar to mine, something happened whether you know, it was being taken to Africa and seeing the millions of wildebeest and going, whoa, we need that here. We need the buffalo back here on those numbers. You know, there's, everyone has that story of connection. And so what we try to do with the treaty and with the work we're doing with the Buffalo Relations Institute is trying to create spaces so that our children can also have that moment of reconnection, that moment when they realize, oh, I miss the buffalo. The buffalo misses me, um, and what's our path to, to making that connection back? And so a lot of the initiatives we do, um, you know, we, we kind of look at ourselves and the work we do, and as, as you know, we're, we're, we're doing for the buffalo what they did for us. They took care of us for so long. You know, it's our turn. We have to put that time and effort in uh, to, to, you know, break down those barriers. I mean... Our lands look very different. Um, the thinking in our in our in our communities is is sometimes is very different. How do we get how do we get past that? How do we come together and and see them in big numbers again? Um, and so you know, in doing that, we want uh, others like us. So you know, we we work together and you know, and it's starting to grow. Our our little group is getting bigger, and it's half you know every time we. We have someone new. We're like, oh, we're we got more people, and we're going to do more things with that. And Amethyst and Leroy come up with more ideas of the things we're going to do next. Um, but we want that in young people, and so a lot of our work is focused on that. Um, how do we create people who are supporters of the buffalo, um, and what kind? You know, coming up with ways that um, sometimes it's people are from a. a, a a nation or a community that doesn't have a lot of land. It's tough to bring a big herd together. Um, but, you know, incorporating the buffalo more into schools, into uh, art projects, into, and so, you know, we're seeing that really grow. Um, sometimes it's, it's initiatives that are beyond our scope and that's lovely. You know, one of the best things is we'll be doing our work and we'll discover a project that's happening and and you know it inspires us and we share much like the signatories of the buffalo treaty do when when they um have their gatherings it's like this is what we're doing here and these are our challenges and how can we support each other 
uh, we're, we're doing that on a community level. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I think at, at its heart is as indigenous peoples, um, remembering that our relatives, our circles of kinship extend beyond our human relations. Uh, they go into those that we share this land with and we have responsibilities. And, and I think that's a lot of what we do with the treaty is, is honor those responsibilities. Thank you. I got talking and I steamed up my glasses. I had to take them off. <laughs> Yeah, okay, now it's back on. So I'm Marie F. Marchand. My Blackfoot name is Natawapim. If you wonder why uh, a French Canadian here has been on the Buffalo, actually, the Buffalo in a way brought me west. But before I, I say that, like Tasha just ended up like, you know, it's a relative. And it took quite a long time for Western science to acknowledge that we're one species among many, what the Indigenous worldview knew from the beginning. And I think we can agree that they really got it right. And it took us a long time to prove it, but it still comes to the same place. So if we're one species among many, so we're not on top. And the buffalo is really a relative, because it is. It is your brother, it's your sister, it's your cookum, your grandfather, your grandmother. Then you enter into that relations. And that's what really is interesting. And if you move out west like me, so my husband, double graduate from the University of Calgary, is from here, his family came before the railway. I'm a French Canadian from the other side. Um, work on conservation, nature conservation, to protect the Lassan Dam River with uh, former elder William Commanda, work on different things with the Cree. And it was 2008. So the Buffalo was calling. They were having the dialogue there. And I'm sitting in my hand on the other side of the country. I should say that because I think East is over there as we started. And <laughs> I should move to Quebec in the West. And it really like people have been thinking after 10 years, the bison had disappeared in Banff. And some of you would remember the paddock where you could drive and be with the buffalo. And but in 97, for many reasons of connectivity, they disappeared. And people have been thinking about them, like missing it. And that's when in 2008, to my husband and others, like, hey, whatever you do works. Do you want to help us bring the buffalo back out west in Banff National Park? I was like, I've never really lived there. I don't know much about the West. But that's an interesting idea because that's something that's that's crazy enough or big enough or something that what do we do? But I came with a really blank slate of what does it mean? I mean, I grew up, I know my caribou, I know my black bear fighting for my blueberries, but that's not the same <laughs> than a bison in the plains. But that's really what brought me west. And as I came to look at the how do we reintroduce bison, something that's so big that cannot be done like on the back seat, opening a door and like get some buffalo back in the park. It, it just needs a little bit more policy and talking to get it right. And actually we needed a helicopter at the end, they flew in, so they couldn't even walk where they are. But it's been a very interesting journey because it really brought me to, while I was thinking I was alone at the beginning of how do you do that? Do people care? and starting talking around. And that's why I really connected with Amethyst and Leroy and with Tasha not long after, because people was like, you got to meet that person. You just got to meet with. You're like, don't worry, you're not alone on your Buffalo world there. And we really quickly came together because that's what Leroy was saying, like what all the way, most of the time I say I do work for the Buffalo. And when I get something wrong, I get a really bad kick. And <laughs> the buffalo is really quick at telling me like you're going on the wrong path here or just let me for a few days till I figure it out by myself. But you have those really conversation. And then when you reach with the Buffalo Treaty that it came together in 2014 that it was signed was a really important moment for bringing the buffalo back to Banff, to, to Banff National Park. Because it was like, oh, we're coming together. There's more wanted the buffalo and there's a real reason. It's not just because historically all the wrong that it's done and doing a right of a wrong. It's not just because like ecologically is a keystone species and it's so important. No cause wallows and create water, sp sprint water everywhere in the grasslands like it does. And, but then it's really culturally, it's who we are on this land. And if I want to live here, I don't think that anyone who lives here can work on something more important than the relationship with the buffalo. It's both on climate change. I can go along for why is it good for climate? Why is it good for all the other birds, the bugs and the species? But why is it so good for the people with the land? 
And I mean, Leroy mentioned the bison burger, but I think that one of the best strategy is for climate change for many reasons. If you live in this landscape, fill your freezer with buffalo. The land will be much better in the climate too if we eat more buffalo and yourself and your health as we've been talking about it. But what we see is like, oh, am I lonely? But with the Buffalo Treaty, we realized that there's many individuals who thought that they were, they were the one person in their communities, somewhere there in Saskatchewan and then somewhere there in Fort Peck. And really those relations to just bring them all back together to the treaties, it's reweaving all those knowledge and all those stories and all those connections. A lot of people sometimes, like if we've seen a lot, the one who has a herd of buffalo, they have some, the two people who take care of their every day, they have an amazing wealth of knowledge of be, being with the buffalo all the time, like being with them and visiting. But they don't always talk to other people. They don't have time. They're with the buffalo. And that's what we realized that the treaty, as we keep working in and implementing, it's like, oh, well, but can you bring us together? Or can we do that together? And Alicia, Alicia, you mentioned the International Buffalo Relation Institute, and that's how it came together. It's Leroy, it's Amethyst, it's Tasha, it's Kara, and many others. We came and said, hey, we're doing that. But it's all relations. We really need to put it forward. We need to formalize those relations. We need to listen to what it is, what the buffalo wants, and then put it out together. So, but it's relation between us, but it's relation with the land. And if you want to know more, it's like buffalotreaty.com or buffalorelations.land, because it's really more than that with ourselves. And that's what you realize that if you live out west, sometimes you can feel small when you're in those big mountains. You're not in a city where everything is human based and built. And we've been missing the buffalo, but it's just so amazing to see already how many more. And Tasha and I just came back from a week in Banff back country last week to visit the buffalo, to visit them every year almost and visit and be with them. They're not always easy to find. <laughs> they play tricks on us quite a few times when they, want to see, when they want to see us the visit. But when they're done, I can tell you those buffalo in Banff, they decide, they're in charge. They're not letting you to come a little foot earlier and end up coming to you like, and now they're gone <laughs> and they won't show you all their babies and but it's a really visiting and the campfire today is part of it we're visiting around the campfire and everyone has stories with the buffalo so i just want to say like it's been an amazing journey that's not finished and that's why i'm the french canadian here but i'm not going to leave and the buffalo doesn't let me go so i'm i'll keep buffaloing <laughs> <laughs> Leroy wants to. Let me uh, let me add one of the things why the buffalo is very important. Most people just see the buffalo just like they would see cattle out in the field and that, but that's not. It goes much deeper than that, okay? The reason, the reason the buffalo is very important is that the buffalo is a keystone species. Now, what do we mean by a keystone species. Well, the example we give when we say a keystone species is think of a professional sports team. When you have a professional sports team, they usually have a superstar. Okay, a superstar. And when, you know, they, you have the superstar and they build the team around the superstar. And if you remove the superstar out of the picture, usually the team kind of falls apart, okay? Well, that's what has happened with 
the buffalo. The buffalo is a keystone species when it comes to the environment. Very, very important. Very different from cattle. Wherever the buffalo roams, it is kind of like an eco engineer. It really brings about eco balance. It brings about all the plants, all the animals, other animals. It brings them back to a balance. That's why we refer to it as an eco engineer. Cattle don't do that. Say, cattle don't do that. Buffalo do. See, so environmentally speaking, the buffalo is very, very important for the environment. Okay. It is also a keystone species as we've already mentioned with regard to our culture. See, that buffalo is related to our songs, our stories, our ceremonies. See, it's also a keystone species. See, so, it serves those roles and so on. That's why it's very, very important. Say. And so it's not just putting buffalo back on the land, just like we would with, with cattle. See, it's not just doing that. Wherever the buffalo roams, it brings back an ecological balance. Give them a few little years, so on. All you have to do is go up to na the National Park in Banff. In a few short years, they're already making a big difference. A small herd of buffalo roaming wild now within the National Park are already making an impact on the land. You know? So it's those kind of things that it's for those kind of reasons that we're wanting to bring the buffalo back. Thank you. Rematriating the bison as Lira just put both Western science and indigenous ways of knowing and weave them together with the keystone species. But in Alberta, plains bison don't exist. They've never been in the Wildlife Act. They do not exist as a species. They can only be owned. So to these days, while environment and science and communication and all the culture says that, in our policies, a buffalo still doesn't have the right to exist. We manage in the fall to get their cousin, the wood buffalo, to mainly most of the territory to exist, but it's still not. So we still have a long way to go. And it is not because when the Wildlife Act was created in Alberta, bison were gone, and they've been gone ever since in policy making. They still do not exist. And like to me, it's just like you can't compute all that knowledge that both ways of knowing tell you. And then we still have still this big disconnect. So that's what the Buffalo Treaty is all about, because time to move on to the next future with the Buffalo. As we move ahead, I, just thinking about uh, um, the discussion and indigenous knowledge that I had uh, a chance to know, part of our creation that we, that I heard, was that creation itself is a energy, it's a power. Um, and if you do something wrong uh, to natural laws, then the consequences of that creation is what you face. 
However, all creation, um, all creation, and I heard that from the old people saying, all creation, there's nobody stronger than anybody else. So creation itself are our natural laws, but it's the interaction of those creations where narratives come out that becomes knowledge, our sciences, our research, our experiences that our elders, our forefathers or ancestors that experienced all that through time with their relationship with the buffalo, those become our indigenous narratives of science and it's told and passed through oral systems. Mm. And it's those oral systems when we talk about how do we parallel then we're living in a default, written default system today, then those challenges of understanding each other need to start, we need to start looking at. And I think uh, discussions like the Buffalo Treaty and, and the stories and the sciences, I think are so important uh, when we make a smudge so that we can talk together on this. So I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists and our elders for joining us today in this wonderful conversation. Well, I just want to say that I will thank everybody for coming and uh, visiting uh, in, our, in our camp here. And uh, um, before we uh, say the closing prayer, I want to ask uh, uh, Rod, for an honor song to honor all of you and to honor the buffalo, honor all creation, uh, which is uh, uh, the world we live in. We all have to survive as natural laws and creations together. And I just want to invite Rod to say uh, uh, to sing an honor song uh, to all that. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna you can stay uh, seated. I'd like everybody to take their shoes off, please. <laughs> I'm gonna sing a toe jam song. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna sing a buffalo song. And you know, when I when when I stop, I want everybody to go, woo! I'm gonna sing it twice and after each time. <clears throat> <laughs> Closing prayer, and we can finish off for the day. Oh, Kahe, I is Chipatapi. I would not be not those. Okay, then just got your mother to be not a Christian quick and a comma to Simon. I don't know, just can it be a cheese, be not a Chipatapi of Akwatimo is Kapinana Nikamo Tanik. Hanika. Ah, 
o ki makita ya ayaksaw pisawa o ku ano ay anakasita pio makisikseto siskini match isyukcika ko tumipio kyo ay wa sito kem stiksi ipoyik si iti iki iki mo piyek ay ispumu sa wistipat pio makisika ka kimatu sa wak anika adapu takso ay o kaya sito kika ko siskato pia kamo tan nista wacima Thank you very much.